You're listening to Tim Bulkley's 5-Minute Bible. second stage in the five-step process is concerned with the differences between the biblical world and ours. And that's where things get tricky, because it isn't all the differences that matter. It is the particular differences that matter that matter. And the differences that matter, matter, because they somehow or other might limit our reading there may be things about our setting, our set, the presuppositions we bring to the text that cause us to miss the point, to misunderstand, or to minimize something. And step two, what's the difference, encourages us to try to work out what those differences are and how we might mitigate their effects of what Duval and Hayes refer to as the river between us and the biblical text as if the Bible was in a village or town across the river and we want to go there to collect something valuable and bring it back and the river is the barrier between us and our target they said there are three main ways to mitigate those differences that make up the river the first is information the knowledge that we can get from Bible dictionaries background commentaries and the like information about the culture, the geography and all the rest that help us to imagine ourselves into their world. It's also possible sometimes to listen to others reading the Bible. People who are different from us will probably understand differently and those differences may very well help us to spot what's going on and what's limiting our reading. And then of course we can reflect carefully ourselves and try to spot the things that may cause problems Perhaps, because think about it there are some characteristics of western thought that comprise that river between us and the biblical text firstly there's our dualism western people are thoroughly inclined to think of the spirit and matter as two different realms and that predisposes us to read back such a distinction into the biblical text where the biblical authors did not intend it and therefore sometimes to misunderstand completely a good example of that comes from Acts chapter 6 where the appointment of the seven to help the twelve is often understood by modern readers as being all about the difference between the people who get on with the material stuff and the people who do the really important spiritual work I don't think that difference was in Luke's mind but we Westerners are both materialist and dualist and it limits our reading and then we're individualists so in Luke chapter 9 when Jesus sends the disciples to heal the sick the default picture in our minds is of some individuals who've got a problem and the problem troubles them and the problem is removed because they're healed we don't see healing the sick as being a sign of the inbreaking of the power of God's rule into this world that notion would be foreign to us and then of course we're comfortable or most of us are we modern Westerners and the whole notion of the kingdom or rule of God is strange to us we're quite happy with the way things are why should we want to pray come Lord Jesus and then we Westerners are instrumental in our thinking we're always looking for outcomes and so Jesus instruction to the disciples to stay in one place on their travels and not to move around from house to house in Luke 9 is understood by readers today often as an instruction that makes them more effective it's not about being effective it's about honoring your hosts and trusting God to provide you see these characteristics dualism individualism comfort and instrumentality and others of course but those are the four I've picked on as being generally quite common and generally quite destructive of Bible reading get in the way and interfere with our reading 
they predispose us to readings that were not intended by the original authors. They're part of the river. Let's look at that by looking at that passage in Luke chapter 9. Did you notice just how prominent that concept of the kingdom of God, of God's rule breaking in, was in this passage? You certainly would have if you'd been reading Luke. But did you notice that bit about power and authority over demons and to cure diseases? It's very prominent in this passage. And the reason for it is because they are to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Proclaim by word and deed that God's rule is breaking into this world and things are being put right. But then, what do you make of him saying, take nothing for your journey? I've heard people read that as an encouragement to us all to take up our cross and follow Jesus, to suffer for the gospel and the like. I don't think Jesus was thinking of suffering. It's not all about you. Jesus was thinking about honouring your hosts. And then the business about when you go to a house, stay there and don't move on. Stay there as long as you're in that village. That's not like some of my students thought about making their ministry more effective, more efficient. It's again about honouring your hosts. And last but not least, the good news. So many people jump at the supposition that the good news here means what today we call the gospel. Jesus loves us and died for our sins and the like. It wasn't. Not here. In this passage Jesus has not yet died. Jesus is sending the disciples and the good news they're to proclaim is the good news that the kingdom of God is breaking into this world and that's why it's to proclaim the good news and cure diseases together at the beginning and the end of the passage though in different words. You see that river can have a powerful effect on our reading unless we pause and think about it but if we pause and think about it we can begin to mitigate its effects bye for now <laughs>